Okay, there we go. Um, so we have Via Scapsis visiting from Bertha Groot's group in Birkingen. And um, this is a little bit of an experiment. It's the first time, at least here, recently running a seminar where we're doing a live stream slash virtual seminar at the same time as doing one in person. Um, so please uh, shout at us or drop something in the chat window if you run to, if you have any problems as we're going, and we'll do our best to resolve them. Um, we have about 10 or 12 people here in the room, and it looks like about 13 people online. Um, anyway, Vias has done some really nice work that I got to hear about earlier this year in Germany and on um, applying finding free energy calculations of various types on a fairly large scale. And so I'm excited to hear about that again today and bring that to all of you. So please take it away. Um, thanks for the introduction. And um, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, without uh, further delay, let, let me start uh, immediately with this uh, topic. So uh, uh, today I chose uh, to tell, yeah, uh, to tell uh, about a particular application of our approaches uh, that we developed in for the gross lab uh, and uh, uh, it's true that uh, we usually use non equilibrium free energy calculations for various uh, systems so we uh, have uh, applications for amino acid mutations for dna nucleotide mutations but today i will concentrate uh, mainly on the uh, on these approaches for the ligand modifications in in the realm of uh, relative free energy calculations, but later we can also have some discussions on, on those other types, but the, the core of the presentation will be about one of these topics. Yeah, that's exactly what I just said, uh, uh, but it just illustrates a bit more uh, in depth. So uh, what uh, we're working in uh, on in, in uh, BIRDS lab is uh, uh, one of the areas is development of the method that uh, we term PMX. So this is the software that we're developing and it is capable to prepare the uh, input for the simulations for the alchemical free energy calculations that will allow you to do something uh, like uh, mutating amino acids in, in, in proteins to assess protein thermostabilities or uh, uh, mutate nucleotides in DNA and the uh, modifications which is the topic of, for, for today. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's dive into the uh, ligand alchemy, how, how we do this. Uh, so uh, uh, we uh, just just a few words about the uh, more the technical side of this. Uh, what we have is, is a, a, a framework uh, which relies on basically on three different uh, modules. So uh, let's start with the first one. Uh, firstly, we'll need to identify uh, atoms. Uh, first, uh, what we will want to do so to calculate relative free energy between uh, given two ligands, uh, we would like to more uh, make a morph between the two of them. For that, we'll first identify atoms to be morphed, then we will build a hybrid structure and topology for the two of them. And we have also the third module there uh, in the top right, uh, which actually will uh, help us to navigate in a, in a given uh, chemical library to suggest the ligand pairs to be morphed. Uh, so firstly, how, how do we do this atom, atom identification for morphs? We have um, two ways to go. Uh, either an uh, alignment algorithm could be used or a maximum common subtraction. They both have their pros and cons. And the, this is, uh, yeah, it's nothing new. We're just using algorithms that, that are uh, available. And, uh, you can ignore them. Uh, somebody's not muted and I'll try to fix it. <laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, what we have is a, uh, quite a now, uh, yeah, an involved scheme that we do not need to go in detail, but basically the, there are those two paths. Either we take two ligands, if they match quite well uh, geometrically, right, we can simply superimpose them and say, hey, we will now uh, make scaffolds, uh, scaffold, uh, or, or maybe, we'll, and the rest will be done. Uh, this is one way, uh, and another way is, for example, uh, is there, uh, maximum common substructure matching, which is a topological matching, right? And, and uh, there might be many, caveats along the way that's why this uh, these paths are so <laughs> these paths are so involved right that one needs to have many checks along the way uh, and uh, for example what could happen uh, if you just use a, a maximum common substructure matching and you have two very different molecules in, in their very different uh, states maximum common substructure will say hey I, they're completely identical there's a, a 
very similar scaffold, and it will suggest you a mapping that is, yeah, just as an example here, those uh, atoms to be morphed into one another. Well, alignment with the with the say only a fraction of these atoms ma matches, and the, depending on what you actually have, are there chiral centers that are involved, or are there some uh, polar uh, groups that you maybe don't want to morph? There are, we have encoded a number of empirical rules, so it's uh, very similar to what uh, has been uh, done in Davis Lab and the, uh, previously. Uh, well, in a, uh, in in their own uh, implementation, their own uh, sets of rules. So. I think um, it's a very much a complementary uh, way to look at that. Uh, and uh, afterwards, uh, we so we have now identified which uh, core which core atoms should become one uh, into another. We can build the hybrid structures and topology. So this is that's just the technical part, which you know, I don't have any illustration for. It. So <laughs> something happens under the hood. And uh, the third part. So this uh, uh, is also very similar approach to, to the building to the uh, uh, low map uh, approach to build graphs. Uh, we just have it in, in our own uh, software, in our own uh, uh, formulation. So how we formulate the, this building procedure is basically given a small chemical library of, uh, of compounds that are depicted here. Uh, we, uh, we can now uh, construct some uh, similarity measure based on how many atoms are being more than how many of them are to be become dummies. We build a, a similarity or distance matrix, and based on that, we can start constructing uh, some graphs uh, of interest, either minimum minimum spanning trees or, or in introduction of uh, uh, redundancies can be done. So this is something uh, quite uh, established uh, in the field, uh, and we yeah we just do it uh, in PMX as well. Uh, all right, so these uh, uh, these are all. Uh, technicalities that we need to know. Uh, how how we uh, then uh, did uh, validate our approach? So we look uh, we looked at the following thermodynamic cycle. Uh, so uh, the question was, is is our implementation robust and do we do everything properly? Uh, so uh, to do that, we looked at this cycle that's here. Uh, we calculated uh, for for given two ligands. We can calculate absolute sol uh, solvation free energies uh, for ligand A and for ligand B. Uh, and on the other hand, so these two paths, these two vertical paths, would not require any uh, hybrid structures and topologies. It's simply the uh, standard code in, in simulation package. We're using Gromox, by the way, I didn't mention, but this is uh, not, not so important here, uh, at this point. And uh, we can also build the hybrid structures and topologies with our tools. And uh, if the uh, everything is done correctly, right? Uh, the, uh, these two, uh, the difference between the vertical branches and the horizontal branches should come out uh, equivalent. And uh, uh, of course, then we need to test this on oh, on a large set of uh, uh, ligand mores. So we use the Davis library, the pre-solved database, uh, with all the parameters there. And it's, it, uh, since it has more than a 600 a set of 600 ligands, we could construct a huge map with very different, very different perturbations really pushing us to the limits. So because it requires all of them to be morphed into very different uh, chemistries. And uh, yeah, we, we get a very uh, close agreement. It's not perfect. So here I'm just depicting on the left uh, is our relative versus the absolute. So two branches versus two other two branches, the differences. And um, most of them fall within the uncertainties of one kilocalorie or so, and but this also served us as a very good uh, set to uh, improve on those rules that we kept having. Sometimes we would see an outlier, like I'm here intentionally showing that we did have some outliers, like 1% of those 600 edges, uh, and they were they always revealed us something unexpected, like I mentioned some chiralities, yeah, which should not match those atoms to be more if they are chiral centers, uh, uh, atoms around chiral centers. And yes, uh, things like that, and then we can prune further our our sets of improvements. All right, so uh, this was our validation. That's uh, it's done with this part, which is maybe a little bit boring or so. Uh, it's uh, nothing uh, applied so far. But then we took our tools to uh, to a real real world uh, cases. Uh, we looked at the. Um, Mm, almost 500 ligand modifications and uh, I think 13 or so uh, protein ligand 
systems. Uh, and we, uh, for all of them, we calculated the following cycle, uh, where we wanted to know what is the difference in the free energy, so uh, di double free energy difference uh, in the binding in the binding affinity upon a ligand modification. Uh, here, uh, yeah, uh, before before going into the results, I would like to uh, note that um, uh, we do not use the classical approach, uh, well, state of the art approach in the uh, uh, field of alchemistry, which would be free energy perturbation. All the results, we, we will compare them to this FEP protocol. Uh, uh, and FEP, just to get everyone on the same page, is the protocol where we would, uh, along the alchemical coordinates, we would discreetly uh, distribute lam uh, lambda points and simulate in, a, in equilibrium conditions at all of these uh, points and uh, uh, get free energy difference uh, between the neighboring points by means of uh, most usually Bennett acceptance ratio uh, uh, estimator. Uh, but we usually do not rely on this, and in this application we also use the non-equilibrium approach, um, which uh, uh, works as follows. So uh, we are simulating, uh, we are performing two long simulations in states A and in state B, uh, where so one state is ligand A and another is a modified ligand. Uh, and uh, gather snapshots from those two uh, simulations and start very fast uh, uh, transitions from A to B alchemically. These are uh, transitions are of, uh, of the order of 100 picoseconds or so, each of them, and we have many of them. Each of them is out of equilibrium, of course, so none of these work values that we would gather would be, uh, uh, can be considered as a uh, free energy difference, but we can rely on uh, Crookes flotation theorem and uh, get the, uh, free energy difference back out of the work value distributions. All right, so we have that. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, now using all these tools, we uh, looked into a number of uh, diverse systems. So uh, some of these systems uh, are in the quite well known uh, uh, data set uh, already explored and mm, yeah, gathered by uh, Schrodinger uh, Corporation. Mm, and it was published in, I think, 2015 in JAX. Uh, which, so it's known Schrodinger's JAX data set, but it's not only that. So those would be, I think, somewhere starting from here uh, or so. Uh, but there are other uh, five other sets that we added in addition. So we have now quite a large data set. And uh, we can, imme let's immediately go to the results. How do we perform? So uh, uh, now uh, on the left here, uh, we will look at the FEP plus. So this is Schrodinger's state-of-the-art uh, um, FEP-based approach uh, using their own proprietary force field. And uh, uh, on the right, there will be different incarnations of our calculations. Those will be uh, either using that uh, or using charms, uh, charm and with the CGNFF, or uh, we will be using consensus. Uh, in, our, uh, um, in our work with, with uh, other um, biomolecules, so amino acid mutations and nucleotide mutations, we have previously um, identified this uh, peculiar feature uh, that uh, um, it is uh, uh, the, the force fields tend to, uh, certain force fields tend to point in opposite directions from the experimental value. This is just an observation. There is, I, I'm not claiming anything that the rigor is there. Simply, uh, you would make an error in one direction in GAP, but in the other opposite error in uh, CGNFF. And just averaging the results in terms of free energies, um, uh, they, they gave more accurate the description of the, of the yeah, more accurately matching experiment values. Uh, all right, and how, how we're looking at this uh, on the top, we're looking at the average unsigned error, so the lower number, the better. And the below is Pearson correlation coefficient is the higher number, the better. And uh, each each number, each each, uh, each uh, symbol here is um, a, an individual repetition of the simulation. In each circle, we used uh, uh, 60 nanoseconds per delta G, right? And we have like 500 of them of, of these delta Gs that we average over. And uh, uh, right. So uh, in terms of average and signed error. Uh, our approach actually performs equally, or uh, yeah, gap is uh, quite close. Uh, charm is quite far <laughs> from the from the Schrodinger's uh, calculations, and we uh, get back to uh, identical numbers as Schrodinger has. And in terms of correlation, it's uh, very similar. 
So gap is closed, charm is a bit further, and in the consensus we're closer, but yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, something within the error bar, uh, slightly lower correlation. Uh, right, so we can uh, go a little bit deeper into this. As I mentioned, there are actually three data sets. So the first, uh, or two, two uh, merged data sets. One is from Schrodinger's um, uh, JAX data set. Another is our additional data set. Uh, this is the same picture that I showed before. Uh, now, if we look at uh, what, what can we see here, is that actually in, uh, if we were to look at the original Schrodinger's data set, we would be doing better than them in terms of average and sign error, but in the correlations, slightly lower. Mm. Uh, there is one more point here, which is now a bit transparent here. I'm trying to show it here, the mouse. Uh, it is the uh, value that was reported in the original, uh, in the original uh, publication, in this Jack's paper. Uh, and why is it a different number? Well, it is actually uh, uh, using an older version of OPLS. So we can also see how this OPLS improved because for our calculations, we used the latest one. So did it improve? Well, not in terms of the absolute agreement of absolute unsigned error, but yes, it did improve in terms of the capturing the trends and will nail down where, where, which uh, systems actually showed us, uh, gave us better agreement. And our data sets, in, in terms of our data set, well, we didn't do ourselves a favor here adding those additional data sets. We actually do a, a bit worse than, than FUP plus. In, in correlation, with, uh, there's uh, everything is uh, equivalent, but in absolute terms, a little bit worse. But yeah, let's let's see where these differences uh, come from. So we can break down everything by the uh, by the system, right? Now we have 30 systems, uh, and this is our consensus result. So we have lots of scatter plots, and uh, we can analyze all of them for a long time. But uh, yeah, let me maybe just summarize a, a few points that we can see. So uh, there are uh, systems that behave very well, like. This one, all the points are blue, so we are blue is mainly where we are within one kilocalorie, I think, or so from error from the experiment. But there are systems that really behave, uh, yeah, they're all over the place, like this MCL one. Uh, it's a, uh, it has outliers both in the small value range and in the large value, value range. There are some interesting systems where we have all the points are blue, but we have zero correlation, or so <laughs> yeah, well, uh, this is. Of because of the very low dynamic range. I think yeah. I'll go to this in the next slide or so. But mainly where, where the errors come most of the time, and uh, this will be summarized further, but uh, basically they are in the, for us it's in the, in the um, uh, areas where we have large uh, free energy differences. So we have an edge where uh, an error, where, where a free energy difference would be large, we do not capture it very accurately, or yeah, less accurately than the smaller changes. Uh, I think this will be now very, uh, should be summarized here. Uh, yeah, exactly, I looked into, it. now I broke all of these. Uh, um, uh, yeah. um, I broke uh, now all of these uh, data points that they had into uh, into the following ranges where the free engine difference between the two uh, ligands that we are looking at is within, uh, I just lost your slides. Yes, yeah. that's it. Okay, so now I will not touch anything. All right, here we go again. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I was saying, this is exactly illustrating simply what I was trying to tell in so many words, but uh, uh, basically in the small uh, different, in the small free energy, for the small free energies, we capture uh, quite accurately, so we have a, a better agreement with experiment than or smaller error uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, uh, then, then the FUP plus approach. But when we go to L, uh, for one to two kilocalories differences, we still capture them uh, very accurately. It's all uh, comparable, but the differences start appearing when we have large uh, differences. So two to three kilocalories or even more, of course, the statistics gets lower. We don't have so many edges there, but yeah, it's really, that's where we are uh, doing slightly worse. But this is also in some sense good news uh, because because uh, we can, in, uh, frequently this probably is happening because of the sampling issues. We're not using any enhanced sampling for this study we, uh, in comparison to FP plus, which does. And uh, maybe there are also some dependencies between the methods. We could discuss this maybe in the, uh, later in the discussion. 
Um, but uh, yeah, so it, 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 we understand at least this effect to some extent. Now, if we, uh, if this is a very busy slide, but just to uh, uh, briefly go over it, it's a, it is the, uh, again, average and signed error and correlations for broken by the system for all of these methods. But uh, only uh, the only message that I would like to bring here is that it really is diverse. So it really is, it really strongly depends for whatever method you look at, either it is uh, Schrodinger C P plus or, or our approach, it will depend on the system very strongly. So correlation can range for us from zero to one, right? But the same goes for any of these points, either red or blue or so. In, in, in general, uh, uh, GAP uh, performs uh, better than for every system, for most of the systems, better than CHARM and the uh, uh, CGNFR, and the consensus is outperforming those, uh, 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 both of those. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, what, what happens to sometimes that is <clears throat> peculiar is, is again this issue of having very for thrombin inhibitors, for example, very low error here. So we have almost the low, one of the lowest errors, but we have no correlation. So and why is it? Well, it is because of the very small dynamic range of the delta delta g values. That's what I was trying to uh, show here. So simply showing all the here, uh, yeah, it's again all of these systems. We can just concentrate in this case on thrombin inhibitors. We have um, experimental value range plotted as a histogram. So experimental values differ between one and between minus and plus one kilocalories per mole. Our approach recovers that range very well. So this gray line, I don't know if you see, but it's really overlapping with the experiment. And the Schrodinger's approach likes to exaggerate those differences. So they do have larger absolute errors, but this actually plays in their hand when capturing the, the trend. Uh, so uh, yeah, that, that's, well, this is, just comes out as an effect of this. Uh, of, of, of the slightly less accurate absolute calculation. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, so we are talking a lot about accuracy and precision. And let's have a little bit closer look into that. Uh, now, uh, if we look at accuracy only, so I plotted here now unsigned errors for all of these 500 ligands for all of these approaches, either with CAP, CGNFR, consensus, and master. And we already, uh, yeah, I mentioned several times that the accuracy on average is similar and the distributions also look very similar. So uh, yeah, there are many curves, but they all overlap more or less well. So uh, all of these approaches, they approach the same uh, agreement with experiment. Uh, but if we look at the precision, so the uncertainty, now the distributions become different. Uh, uh, the, the distributions are yeah, those curves and the bars are the mean values. So if we can just, during our I, we just let's look at the bars. Uh, and my strategy plus is very certain in its answer. So it's, if we repeat it three times, I didn't mention all of these, uh, all of these simulations. Or uh, every delta G value was uh, um, obtained by repeating the simulations three times, uh, at least. Uh, so that all the uncertainties are actually not just uncertainties of an estimator, but uncer actual uncertainties of the uh, uh, of the yeah, also sampling of the uh, configurational space. So we, uh, uh, if we repeat three times the FEP plus uh, calculation, it will uh, give almost identically the same answer within one kilojoule per mole or so. If we repeat now uh, with any of these power approaches, we get a larger uncertainty between, well, around two kilojoules per mole or so on average. So this is re really substantial and we are still looking into this but the, so far it's just an observation. But uh, well, uh, uh, in defense of these approaches, we just looked at the accuracy. So we know that the accuracy is identical. Just one approach thinks that is very certain that this is correct answer. <laughs> Another approach is not so certain. Uh, but uh, I'm not uh, claiming that this uh, low low precision is a, is a valid. Mm, and uh, all right, so now for the for the next part of the talk, let's have a look at several systems to see whether we can understand what, what is uh, driving these uh, differences in accuracies that we saw. So uh, for the first one, uh, I looked into PTP1P. This is uh, uh, an, quite an interesting system. It's a, a phosphatase, so it takes a cleaves phosphate away from tyrosine and it participates, I think, in, in 
in one of the signaling pathways then. Uh, but the, uh, for us, it's, uh, what is interesting in this case, it, it is a mem uh, uh, one of the members of the uh, Schrodinger's JAX dataset. And uh, it, is, it has a catalytic cysteine, which is, uh, is known to participate in this cleavage mechanism. And it's known uh, in that in APO state, this cysteine is deprotonated, so in it's oxidized state, but it's not uh, just uh, uh, in, in such a, a form like this. In APO state, it actually is shown from a crystallographic structure that it should make even a covalent bond with, a, uh, with another neighboring serine residue. So something strange there. But all right, we know that it should be deprotonated in the APO state, although the, uh, the further phase is not really no, uh, but uh, uh, now what happens for the uh, test case of the ligands that we're looking at? Uh, well, uh, these ligands make, th this is a, crystal, a crystallographic uh, position, pose of the ligand, and we know that the distance is quite small. So it's, it is, uh, it, it's on the edge of making a weak hydrogen bond potential. And if we just run some predictors, empirical predictors, this was the first carboxy group uh, would be predicted to be uh, deprotonated and cysteine would be predicted to be protonated. So, uh, all right, so we have these predictions. However, in the uh, uh, original JAX data set, what the uh, Schrodinger people modeled uh, was the cysteine deprotonated cysteine. So uh, they had, had no proton there. And the results, so now it becomes a bit in, uh, quite entangled, but let's have a look uh, chronologically at all the results. So this is the uh, first on the left, is the uh, original Schrodinger's uh, publication in, with the deprotonated cysteine, so cysteine the charge minus one, and the uh, values that they got, right? So uh, the standard uh, average and sign error and correlation. They're not particularly good, but well, it's uh, the indecent regime. And there are some outliers there, right? Now in the new uh, version, new release of their uh, force field, they removed completely all of these outliers and got a perfect agreement, almost, almost perfect uh, agreement with the experiment. Now, um, if, if we were to follow this uh, logic that we kind of uh, uh, knew, uh, kind of convinced ourselves that there might be a chance for cysteine to be protonated, we can protonate it and, and calculate I'll just join it again. Uh, yeah. Oh, no. hmm. On the screen, it looks like you're still okay, but why don't you, uh, you keep talking? To them. Okay. At least the moment we have your slide up here still. All right. No. Ah, so the slide is frozen. Okay. All right. um, so what we have then uh, is the, uh, is the, uh, when, when we protonate the cysteine, we have, uh, of course, loss of accuracy. So it, it, the force field only to tolerates the deprotonated uh, cysteine. So it was really, uh, uh, it almost seems that it was made to be exactly like that. Now, for our approaches, we uh, first start with the deprotonated cysteine, and we do have a yeah, comparable result to the early Schrodinger's approaches. Then if we make an artificial construct of the pro of just removing the charge, no addition of a proton, but just neutralizing cysteine, just something intermediate, we get a slightly better result, and then maybe even better vis visible on the correlations. And if we uh, uh, protonate cysteine, we get even better accuracy. So we really, uh, for us, uh, the best accuracy uh, agreement with the experiment would be if the cysteine was in its protonated state, which we have uh, predicted. Uh, but so this simply uh, uh, shows how one could modulate, well, uh, fine tune the force field to reproduce well the values that are in your data set without, um, yeah, well, uh, by driving it into some certain direction, which is not necessarily a uh, carbon stone that this has to be, the steel group has to be protonated. And the uh, 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 yeah, uh, it, it's, uh, I'm not claiming that it's really like that, that it's oxidized or reduced cysteine that should be there, but I'm just saying that one. Oh, now we have another. Maybe we should try to join one more time because it looks like if I do it from my laptop, we'll get a mirror image of the.
video so people can't read the text. So I'm guessing that's internet connectivity problems. If I give you a LAN cable, like an ethernet cable, do you have a plug for it? No, unfortunately. I have a doctor, do you, do you take USB-C? Yeah. Okay. So why don't you work on reconnecting, if, even if you have to drop out really quick, and I will grab an adapter. I'm gonna pause recording for a minute. We'll be right back, right back online while I grab an adapter from the store. Okay, hope just hopefully we're coming back online now. Barely. Hopefully it'll be better now. We can switch Wi-Fi networks. Okay. Um, so you just finished this slide, I think. Right, we finished here. And the, I wanted to go over just a, a several more systems because they show some interesting behavior as well. So uh, this is another uh, uh, case that we looked at and uh, found something interesting. So uh, here we, we used GA. To cal uh, in this example, to calculate some free energy differences uh, for galactin. And uh, uh, in one case, for example, here, uh, let's have a look, we have uh, quite an inaccurate result. This is already the difference, uh, this is not the free energy difference, but this is the error that we make from the experiment. So it, this is quite inaccurate. And what is this? So uh, we could immediately make a conclusion that, yeah, all right, so one of these, so these are all relative free energies, right? So I, one of these chemical groups is probably parameterized wrong, right? Uh, is it the um, uh, this methylamine or 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 uh, uh, or uh, yeah <laughs> another group. Uh, uh, well, uh, we look at at the uh, or methoxy group. Then uh, we look uh, at the let's say we probe this system, uh, this uh, methylamine with the, uh, replacing it with dimethylamine, and we see a, a small error. So all right, then this must have been a methoxy group that was wrong. But then we probe it with the, by replacing it with the hydroxyl uh, group, and no, it's also no error, right? So those, um, so what it seems that uh, the uh, force loop was able to capture correctly the uh, populations of the intra-chemical groups, but not in, right? So th there might be some very, yeah, and this is difficult, I think, to both, well, now we captured it, but it's also difficult to uh, know in advance how to parameterize when parameterizing the force with one doesn't really care about this, uh, well, it has to be an absolute, an absolute free energy that is correct. But it seems that uh, there might be some unexpected uh, um, uh, uh, caveats along the way. And uh, what I meant for the last system, I picked one um, to look at where we actually, what I mentioned uh, to illustrate the effect of force fields pointing in the opposite direction from the experimental value and the CMAT system had uh, more than half of uh, all the calculated free energies were, dip were going in different directions from the experiment. Uh, it's, a, it's a busy slide, but uh, what I would like simply to show here is that, uh, yeah, we're looking at the, at the ligand, which, uh, which is here, and we're only replacing the substituent with many of them. And some of these substituents really, uh, let's say, let's look at one of these codes, 420015, so it's this one, for whatever reason, uh, n none of these others, but for only this one, uh, in four different cases, it decided to go uh, to be overestimated in free energy in GA, but not but uh, underestimated in CGNF. Uh, of, of course, uh, this doesn't directly give me a clue which exactly parameters. So are those the charges or are those the uh, the hydrals and what to fix? But it simply tells. Is that there are two sets of parameters that and CGNF that uh, needs to be yeah they they need to be uh, I'm not saying that average but uh, uh, taken into into account maybe uh, also maybe this brings us to the limitations of the of the uh, classical single point charge uh, models of, of uh, charges and force fields right maybe one needs to, indeed needs two sets of parameters to represent certain chemistries. Uh, and also, it's quite peculiar because these substituents, they, they just, looking by eye, they look quite similar. And there is no, at least for me, an immediate reason why one of them should always be overestimated and another, another, uh, others perform just fine in uh, other comparisons. 
right? But this is just a, these are just the observations from all the scan. And yeah, here it's already the summary. I already spent more than half an hour on, on this. Uh, um, so what we talked about was uh, relative free energies and the uh, application of those. But uh, if we have time and if, uh, if anyone is interested in, uh, I also have some uh, backup slides on the things that we are currently working on, on the absolute free energies. And also uh, frequently I get the questions. So uh, we also looked into closer into the uh, comparison of the equilibrium free energy perturbation approach and non-equilibrium TI to see how well they perform. Uh, but uh, yeah, maybe we can start some discussion. Questions and discussion so far? This is uh, Mike Delson. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, really nice work. Thank you. I have a um, question about the how you did the non-equilibrium stuff. So um, was it essentially, I mean, do you make windows and then partially equilibrate each window in effect? Or is like an alternative to bar or M bar? Or is, there, is it almost like a sort of a pulling, as it were, through um, parameter space? Um, I, I would uh, say the latter. Uh, we did not uh, do any windowing or so. Uh, those were really uh, two um, equilibrium simulations. So without just standard MD simulations at the end stage. And from them, I would say uh, it's a, an analogy to pulling. So taking one state and pulling, but uh, along the alchemical coordinates, not the yeah. physical coordinate, and really pulling very fast to reach uh, the other state, but not to reach the equilibrium of the other state, but uh, simply to reach the, well, uh, Hamiltonian of state B, completely physical Hamiltonian. So, and then, so you do sum in one direction and then sum in the other direction, basically, and collect statistics? Uh, yes, uh, exactly. We do uh, bi-directional pulling uh, and uh, uh, collect the, well, distance in, in terms of work uh, values. Those work values are three energies, but uh, with some dissipated work components. So due to friction or, or simply the, uh, due to the fact that we don't end up also in the equilibrium state. Right. So how many, how many do you do in each direction? Uh, all of these were done uh, uh, on the order of hundreds. So a hundred, let's say a hundred in one direction and a hundred in another. Okay. And then you said some at 60 nanoseconds. So was that spread over the hundred or is that? Uh, this is the, uh, uh, Cumulated time in total, it is uh, 60 nanoseconds of uh, uh, time spent per delta G. Uh, um, so uh, uh, I think for the equilibrium run, so uh, all of these, it's important to start those, of course, non equilibrium pullings from the equilibrated ensemble. Mm. And for the equilibration of the ensemble, we, uh, we only used six nanoseconds mm. uh, per, per two states, of course. So all the rest was then. Then okay, thank you. Hi, this is Dave Slockauer. I have a question uh, following on to what Mike said, which is, so how do you calculate the uncertainty in the work done during this non-equilibrium process? Or what is the typical value of the uncertainty? And then since you end up doing it multiple times in both directions, do you come up with some summary statistic that gives you the uncertainty in each transformation? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a good uh, point. So we calculate uncertainties uh, uh, for in both in two ways and combine them into one estimate of uncertainty. Uh, so first, uncertainty comes from the um, from the uh, estimator. Uh, simply, uh, we rely on the maximum likelihood estimator uh, for the free energies. So once we collect all of these uh, uh, work values, uh, we then can use something uh, that is essentially Bennett acceptance ratio for the non-equilibrium free energies. That's a, um, it, it has equivalent form of that. And then, uh, of course, we can bootstrap uncertainty by yeah, simply bootstrapping the work values uh, to recal recalculate this estimator. Of course, this is just uh, uh, the, the uncertainty that is, uh, yeah, I, I call it the uncertainty of the estimator of the estimation. But we repeat everything, as I mentioned, multiple times, all of the, starting from scratch, all of the simulation, both equilibrium and the non-equilibrium part several times. And this gives uh, us another uh, uh, uncertainty, set of uncertainty, uh, 
uncertainties, which is um, also covering, um, uh, well, uh, sam I would call it sampling uncertainty. So uh, if we were to uh, be driven to uh, a different phase space region by just by the stochastic nature of MD, we would actually also capture a different free energy difference, right? So uh, we all of these uncertainties that I was reporting combined both of these uh, uh, factors. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Anybody else? I think there was this. Oh, that was I'd love to hear about the absolute and the equilibrium versus non-equilibrium briefly, if you can. You can manage it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, those are only a few slides. Uh, and oh, I'm sorry, I had to acknowledge people that worked on this and the, and the findings and the, everything. So here's a very quick acknowledgement. Thank you. Um, uh, now, uh, yeah, let, let's uh, have a look into the absolute because um, this is a bit of a different beast, right? We, then we need to uh, uh, really think of the problem in a slightly different way. We need to uh, make a large perturbation. It's always well, most. Uh, Frequent it will be large, at least larger than in the relative case. Convergence will be slower, slower will require restraints. But yeah, it is uh, possible, as we'll see, uh, to do it also in the non equilibrium way. So uh, we started with, uh, in looking into this from starting from uh, the work uh, done by uh, uh, Matea uh, Aldegi, uh, who looked into the absolute free energies a few years ago uh, uh, based on the equilibrium approaches. And uh, yeah, this is just a standard cycle, which also looks slightly more complex than for the uh, mm, relative changes. But uh, yeah, we don't need to go into the detail of the cycle. This is, uh, I think, you know, fairly standard way. Simply, there is an additional component of adding three strains to the decoupled state of the ligand. Um, right, and uh, what Matteo looked at uh, some uh, a few years ago was uh, bromosporin uh, um, binding to different bromo domains. Uh, so he took uh, 22 different proteins and one single ligand and uh, uh, docked the ligand and later calculated the free energies to those different uh, proteins. Uh, so basically uh, probing the selectivity of, of this uh, ligand to those different bromo domains. And he got very good agreement with the experiment with the uh, uh, um, equilibrium FEP approach. Um, uh, but yeah, it required quite a bit more sampling to reach the convergence. It took uh, 600 nanoseconds in comparison to 60 nanoseconds per single delta G value. Uh, and these are his results. I just re uh, reco uh, yeah, uh, recovered them from, from his publication. And we did exactly the same. Now this is a bit uh, uh, more, more data on the slide. We did exactly the same with a non-equilibrium approach. Uh, well, first of all, uh, on the left, it's exactly the same what I just showed uh, from Matthias publication, the same plot. And uh, then we recalculated everything just uh, to have the same uh, data in, in our setup uh, with FEP uh, equilibrium approach. We got slightly worse agreement. Uh, there are some statistics given, uh, so average and, uh, some, some uh, estimations of uh, uncertain of uh, accuracy is given. So average and signed error, let's say, is one and a half kilocalories per mole, which is slightly lower than uh, usually we would expect for the uh, from the um, relative changes, uh, what, what we got is uh, above two kilocalories per mole. And uh, uh, it's a, a bit difficult to uh, say for sure, but uh, one difference, uh, the main difference is actually that Matteo was using replica exchange, so enhancing the sampling between, uh, between the um, discrete states of, of the lambda, uh, by, by making the transition between the, the lambda states. We did not do this in this case. Uh, and uh, yeah, but uh, also uh, we can see that uh, in other metrics, we, uh, this approach did not do worse. Actually, it did even better. We got an even better correlation in the, within this data set. And this is the non-equilibrium TI, the, uh, this approach of non-equilibrium. And we get uh, very close within the uncertainty of the average and sign error and the RMC uh, within the uh, range of uncertainty in comparison to the previous approach, and again, uh, slightly better in this case, uh, correlations, uh, whichever correlation we we'll look at. So uh, yeah, this is our uh, investigation uh, into the absolute free energies. And uh, yeah, just one more additional slide, we can also probe, probe the convergence, how quickly it happens. 
how quickly the, the results converge. Uh, here I'm looking at the RMSC and Pearson correlations for different approaches. So uh, uh, let's uh, let's concentrate maybe on one of these RMSC. So this this uh, is uh, our reference what Matea got uh, from his study, <clears throat> and actually it's uh, quite quick that the, that we could reach this value. We would get uh, already the same accuracy just by having uh, this half of the simulation time. And uh, it, it seems that uh, FEP it takes a bit longer to converge. Of course, this can be facilitated by some replica exchange or so, but uh, without any enhancement, it seems that uh, non-equilibrium converges a little bit faster. Uh, but uh, of course, there are other lines that you can see. They are just more for the amusement. Uh, those are uh, the single one, one directional pooling. So um, based on Yersinskis equality in, that, uh, in, on, in these cases, and those could be either directly using Yersinski, so uh, which would be then uh, a biased estimation of the, uh, given the finite sampling uh, of the uh, free energies. So I think these are the green ones and the, the or, or the darker ones. And the other two are uh, based on the Gaussian estimation of um, cumulant, cumulant expansion of the Yersinskis equality. Those should be unbiased. However, they suffer from severely from other uh, artifacts. So yeah, I, I would not rec recommend going with the uh, one directional pooling experiment. Right, and this, so this is on the, that's what they had on the absolute free energies. Uh, and another uh, few minutes I could spend on the, a little bit on the preliminary results, what we have <clears throat> for the comparison of the efficiencies. If they, or we can just discuss. Yeah, I think, I think there are a few minutes. Okay, so really in a few minutes. So there have been a few studies now recently that aimed to do that. And uh, we just wanted to have our own approach uh, because uh, uh, we wanted to address three uh, main, main uh, uh, issues that usually arise in these comparisons. So first we wanted to have a large number of realistic perturbations, those that would be we would frequently encounter in our realistic applications for mean acid mutation, for example, or ligand modifications. Uh, not, not just taking one particular example, but many of them. Uh, then we wanted to set equivalent conditions and sampling time. So that really, uh, not uh, that we would be running uh, for, one uh, for 10 nanosegments one approach, another for 100 nanoseconds and then somehow try to meet them by uh, extrapolating the result by assuming that samples are uh, uncorrelated and then uncertain to drops by a uh, square root of n or so, but uh, no, really having uh, uh, equivalent conditions. And uh, the third part was a known target value. So uh, uh, if, if one approach converges to one value, another to another, but we don't, do not know what the true answer is, it's a problem. And we started constructing these closed uh, cycles where uh, we perform uh, in the single simulation box uh, for two systems that are uh, restrained in, uh, uh, far apart from one another, uh, far beyond the cutoff, uh, the real space cutoff value. We start perturbing one system into another, but we, have, we also make exactly the same perturbation in the opposite direction. And this by construction needs to give us a zero value. So we have a target value. <clears throat> and uh, uh, immediately let's have a look at, we, we probed many of them. First, we started by probing all the amino acid perturbations in the relative uh, free energy calculation scheme. Uh, and those are, yeah, this, uh, each of the curves contains uh, some, uh, maybe I think uh, about uh, six microseconds of sampling time. And each of them, uh, on the x-axis is a sampling percentage, so how much time we spend to sample to get this number, and the delta delta g, which we just uh, agreed that it has to be zero, is given here on the y-axis. So if it is, uh, let's say here, going to zero, then this protocol is giving us very, very good uh, convergence. These are simply different uh, protocols that we could probe for the non-equilibrium TI. We could spend more time in the equilibrium state, we could spend more time uh, in the transition state, we can run then more transitions. But the uh, but the one requirement is that each of these curves then will spend, uh, um, I think, 60 nanoseconds in total per run. And we ran it uh, multiple times, I think 10 or so times. 
and uh, uh, we can compare them equivalently to the equilibrium FEP, and we see immediately that there are some some problems. Some, um, these are again different protocols, give some uh, somewhat different values. You can use more. In this case, we can use either more windows or fewer but longer windows, or we can use uh, a sp separate uh, splitting of Coulombic and uh, Leonard Jones interactions. So I'm just showing a selection of those. We have, I think. 10 protocols for one and 10 protocols for another. <clears throat> These are the best performing ones. So we do see uh, quite severe problems when it comes to charge changing. Well, the, uh, the box conserves charge, but the, the mutation is charge uh, changing. So uh, yeah, this is one uh, example. Then we looked at other set of, uh, in this case, ligands. So these were amino acids. Now we are looking at ligands. Those are really the solvation free energies. Solvation in one direction, solvation in an, or uh, decoupling in one direction, coupling in another, and it's a very similar picture that the non-equilibrium converges faster than equilibrium, which sometimes is really giving some <clears throat> off results. Uh, but uh, again, I have to uh, uh, note here that all of these equilibrium are without any enhancement of sampling, so we just uh, have had equivalent conditions for both. So yeah, these these are quite prelim preliminary results. In terms of Right, and I think, yeah, I don't, I don't have any further on this. this one. Thank you. It's really, really nice talk and great stuff to learn. Other, other questions? Either the web or the room? Okay, cool. This is, this is really good. I'm looking forward to talking with you more off offline. So uh, thanks everybody for joining and um, thank you for such a great seminar. We really appreciate it.